As long as I'm okay and I'm staying true to who I am. Hey everyone, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 304. Today, we're joined by Master Nia Sanchez. If you don't know my voice, you are probably new to the show. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and we make all kinds of fun stuff for martial arts. Doesn't matter whether you're a karate person, a taekwondo person, maybe a jujitsu person. We have great apparel. We have a growing line of training accessories and equipment. You can find it all at whistlekick.com, and we even have some stuff over at Amazon. If you want the show notes for this or any of our other 303 wonderful episodes, including topic shows from Thursdays or interviews from our Monday releases, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you know someone that would be a great guest, head on over to the website, fill out the show form, the show request form, tell us a little bit about the person, and we'll reach out. We'll try and get them on the show. There are very, very few people that have not said yes. Let's talk about today's guest. You know, it's not often that we have someone on the show who has reached a high level in both martial arts and something completely unrelated, or is it completely unrelated? I'll let you decide, to martial arts. On today's show, we have Master Nia Sanchez, who some folks may know as the winner of Miss USA 2014. But here today, she's Master Sanchez, martial artist, Taekwondo practitioner, with a number of other martial arts under her belt, both literally and figuratively, and she's here to talk about her life as a martial artist and what makes her tick. It's a great conversation. I had a lot of fun with this one, and I know you will too. Check it out. Master Sanchez, welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be doing this with you. Yeah, I'm I'm glad too. We've we talked about it a couple times. You know, obviously coordinating schedules between busy people is never an easy thing, as anyone out there knows. But here we are. We finally made this work, and I've been looking forward to it. We set this up. This it's been a few weeks. That we, it's been a few since, weeks. Since We're we finally here. Yeah, I'm yeah. ready to get going. <laughs> and here we are. Well, obviously, this is a martial arts show. There may be some mm-hmm. folks out there who know you for non-martial arts reasons. We're going to get into all that, but let's start. Let's build some foundation to work from here. How did you get started as a martial artist? So I got started in Taekwondo when I was eight years old. My dad was raised in a military family, joined the military, and then worked at a prison. He worked at Folsom and then a prison in Southern California. And we had moved to a new city. And I was so out of my comfort zone, I became extremely introverted and shy. I was the girl that like stared at her feet when she walked down the street. And being my dad's only daughter and him coming from, you know, the very strict background and seeing some of the worst of the worst people on a regular basis, he was like, okay, no, this is not going to be happening. So he put me into Taekwondo to help boost my confidence and to help me just be more of like a strong, independent little girl even because he knew that it was dangerous for a little girl to not be aware of her surroundings, not even feel confident enough to help hold her head up and look at, you know, people around her and be aware of what's going on. So he put me into Taekwondo. I refused to do it at first. I thought it was just for boys. So I made him join with me. So my dad, myself and my little brother all joined Taekwondo at the same time. So I'm glad that I was such a stubborn little girl because it was such a cool family experience to go up through the ranks together. Um, So yeah, that's how I got started at the beginning of the journey. Nice. Well, obviously that journey continued. So at what point did you realize it was not just for boys? Well, it's actually funny. I have such a clear memory when I was a yellow belt, the instructor asking everybody why they took Taekwondo. He went around the class and asked everybody for their answer. And, you know, there'd be kids saying, I want to break boards. I want to be a black belt. We got, you got a variety of answers. And my answer was, my dad made me. (laughs) So I still didn't want to do it even after I had achieved an accomplishment of like earning a belt, which you think might like encourage a little kid. Okay, cool. I'm I'm getting good at this. Let me, you know, have more of a passion for it. But I didn't really fall in love with Taekwondo until my first competition. So once I discovered the whole competitor's aspect of it and where you train really hard to perfect your technique and to be quick, you know, with sparring and all that, my first competition, I was a green belt. So we were doing sparring and I 
absolutely fell in love. I got a first and a third place. And then from there, it just ignited the passion. So instead of my dad dragging me to Taekwondo every single day, I was dragging him. I was wanting to work out six days a week. We worked out every single day because I wanted to get better for my next competition. So the competition part definitely ignited the passion for me. Mm. So here in a, a fairly short period of time, maybe not short if, if we talk to your eight-year-old self, but early on, right. you move from looking at your feet, being completely unsure of yourself, to stepping out into competition, which is already an intimidating thing. You, even people who compete week after week will often admit that they're nervous every time, at least a little bit. Something oh, yeah. Something's changing in there. Something must have changed in who you were as a person from martial arts. So w was that apparent to, you know, say the adults around you at that time, or, or was it only in retrospect later? No, it definitely was. My dad, well, if you ask him, he'll say that he, right around the time where I started competing is when he saw me start to come out of my shell a little bit. I always attribute it to the life skills that you learn from martial arts, whether it's Taekwondo or another martial art. I feel like there's so many life skills. And when I talk now, I, I do public speaking. I always attribute so much of my success to what I learned at a young age in Taekwondo and martial arts in general. You learn to be independent. You learn to be confident. You learn to present well, you carry yourself well in a room full of people with, when you have so many eyes on you, there's so many things that you learn, respect, kindness, being prompted on time for interviews or meetings or whatever it is. So I definitely started to come out of my shell and everyone around me noticed it. And I think it made, it kind of gave my dad a little bit of an ease. Okay. My daughter is aware of her surroundings now. She, she's more confident in who she is. She's not so shy. So it definitely broke me out of my shell and it, it gave me life skills. That's what I always say. Taekwondo, you know, is a beautiful martial art and I've learned so much from it. But the number one thing that I've taken away to apply to the rest of my life is, is the life skills that you learn. Cool. So what did competition after that first incident, that first experience as a green belt look like? Were you competing, you know, frequently or was it, you know, a few times a year and how far did you take it? Oh my gosh. So <laughs> I was obsessed with competition after that. We did every single regional tournament, which I think we had about three a year. And then at the time, my organization, now they have one like international tournament a year, but at the time they had three international tournaments a year. So we were flying across country to compete at international tournaments since I was probably about 10 years old every single year, three times a year competing internationally. Uh, all of the competitions were held in the U S though. So flying to the South, to, you know, different places in the U S and one of my favorite stories that I always share about just never giving up on your dreams and what you want to do and what you're passionate about was my first competition internationally. I was a purple belt at the time and I was so excited because I always placed regionally and I was good. And my first international competition, I went and I was ready to do this. I was so excited. I essentially got a spirit award. That's what they called it, a spirit award. Like, thanks for coming. You didn't place. Good try. Good luck next time. <laughs> and, you know, I was so disappointed and so broken at, about that experience because I had only ever known at least placing at the regional level. But my instructor, I had such a wonderful instructor that I still look up to this day. And he said... You, he said, don't let it get you down. Come back next time and show them how good you are. So I worked really hard. It was the last international competition that year. And then the next year I came back and I ended up getting all first place across the board, including free design form, sparring forms, everything. So it goes to show, you know, just because you don't succeed at something the first time, it does not mean that you can't be successful. You just have to Get, you have to work harder and that's just life. Like sometimes people want to just show up and do the same thing and wonder why they're not getting results. You just have to really, really work hard and you can make it happen. Um, but I can continue, continue to compete. And it was definitely interesting, the transition between, between the, I forget what they called it, but it was essentially like the preteen division. And then you moving up to like the adult division where I'm 15 years old competing against women that are in their twenties and have been training in Taekwondo martial arts, for 10, 15 years, and I'm over here like a few years in, um, 
So that was definitely an interesting transition for me too. I I had been killing it when the like team division, I was always getting first, if not all first, at least first, second, third, I was always placing doing well. And then I went up into the adult division and I think I got all third. So it was, I still did well for being going from teen to the adult division, but it was, it was definitely a learning curve for sure. So I just, I don't know. I loved, I loved competition. I loved sparring. I loved forms and always trying to better myself. And I definitely did. I learned a lot through competition. Now you're not saying it, but some of the words you're using make me suspicious that maybe there was a lesson in humility in there that you're thankful now that you learned. Were, were you, were you starting to get a little full of yourself? Winning oh, everything? For sure. Okay. <laughs> yes, for sure. And it's so true. It's like now that, and it, it, like I've said, martial arts and the lessons I've learned have applied to my entire life. And with my pageant title and success in that world, people always say, oh, you're so normal. You're so real. It's like, I think I learned those lessons at a young age where don't get a full head. Don't, you know, think you're all this hot stuff because there's always someone better than you and there's always room to improve and room to get better. So that life lesson I've definitely taken away. I had definitely been like, okay, I'm hot stuff. I know what I'm doing. And then, you know, you move up to the next level and you're like, okay, no, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to really level up again. So yeah, I definitely learned life lessons of humility through martial arts. There's always someone better. You always need to keep working to be better and and stay humble in the process for sure. Nice. Now you brought it up. So it's, it's fair game for me to talk about a little bit now too. There may be some folks out there who know you first and foremost, not as a martial artist, a martial arts competitor, but as a pageant competitor. And I'm going to guess just in the way that you have talked about martial arts today, in the way that I've seen some of your your photos from your time in pageant competition relating to your Taekwondo, that there's quite Mm -hmm. a bit of synergy. There's a lot of overlap going on between, at least for you, those two worlds. So why don't you talk to us now about how Taekwondo competition became pageant competition? Oh, yes. So overlap for days, like it's, it's crazy how much I took all the things that I've learned in Taekwondo and transferred them into the pageant world. Um, mostly the discipline that it takes to not be discouraged if you don't place, whether it's Taekwondo or in the pageant world. I trained for, trained, I'm saying trained as if I'm training for Taekwondo. I competed for five years in a row before I became Miss USA. So I competed at the regional and the state level multiple years and did well, but obviously didn't win until the right timing. I believe everything happens in God's timing. And so it was, I wasn't ready to become Miss USA at 19 years old. I probably would not have won if I had competed for the title at 19. So um, I became Miss USA when I was 24 years old. And there's just I I was very blessed to be able to use a lot of what I've learned. And and I've trained in multiple martial arts, Taekwondo being the longest, but Taekwondo, Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai. And I use so much of those life skills and just the physical skills as Miss USA. It kind of naturally became my platform to teach women self-defense across the country. Um, My top five question when you're in top five and you have no idea what's coming your way. And this question pretty much determines whether you get the crown or not. I was asked about rape on college campuses and how I could help fix the problem, which I'm like, how do you ask a 20 something year old girl, how she can fix this huge issue. But all I could do is respond with what I knew. And, and I knew that I could help teach women self-defense And there's a a lot more to that subject and we could go into depth in that because I had a lot of feminists hating on me for that answer, but that's what I could do. I could teach women self-defense and that's the way that I could help the problem. And I ended up winning. And then with that, that transitioned into my platform for the whole year. And I was able to teach women self-defense in high schools and colleges across the country. Now you mentioned hate from feminists and and we don't have to unpack this too much, but maybe you could share a little bit more about what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So long story short, after I answered the question, you have 30 seconds to answer a question that you have no idea, even the content or the subject matter. 
and you have to give your best answer in 30 seconds. So I did. I said that I can teach women self-defense. The feminists out there, not all feminists, there was, I saw an article where there was someone that said, I'm a feminist and I agree with Miss USA, but majority of them attacked me for about two weeks about saying, well, women shouldn't have to learn self-defense. Men should not rape. And of course, men should not rape, but that's not the world that we currently live in. So my defense that is, of course, if there's any way we can, you know, have discussions with high school men and college men and, and really break down no means no and what's rape and what's not. And, you know, we like really have that conversation so they understand and, you know, we can do our part to help on that. And that's great. Let's do that. But for the current world that we live in, I'm going to teach women self-defense. So, you know, there was, there was a lot of pushback on my answer, um, but it's an answer that can be, you can sit down and you can have a 20 minute conversation on it to fully discuss it and unpack it, but you only have 30 seconds on stage. So I did the best I could within 30 seconds and I see their side of it, but I also live in the world that we currently live in. So I'm going to do my part to help women the way that I can. So that's kind of the, the gist of it. Yeah. Now you mentioned you, you caught that flack for a few weeks after the competition. What was yeah. your, what was your mindset? Cause here I, I imagine in one sense you're on cloud nine, you you've achieved something you've been working for, for a number of years. And then I'm I'm going to speculate as a martial artist, martial arts is pretty core to who you are. It's one of your, your founding elements and it's something that you hold dear. So here, your answer is something coming from a place that is very personal, something that is so important mm-hmm. to your, your martial arts training. And that very answer being attacked, I think if I was in your shoes would feel like an attack of my martial arts training. Mm-hmm. Was, was there any kind of, was, was it, was it difficult? Were you feeling conflicted between the joys of victory and maybe this, this element of criticism that's on such a, a, a large national stage? You know, I was a bit, but at the same time, I had done so much mental and emotional prep because I wanted to be Miss USA. And I knew that if I became Miss USA, there's, you know, there's so many more eyes on you. There's, there's so much more that comes with having that title. So I honestly was mentally prepared for just about anything to come my way. I knew I did my best to prepare in every area and I was, I was fine with my answer. So my belief at the end of the day is as long as I'm okay and I'm staying true to who I am, then there can be a million naysayers out there, but you can go ahead and talk because it's not going to affect me. I'm happy with who I am and, and the way that I'm handling situations. So I was completely fine with it. I was like, okay, you can, you can say that all day long. Still doesn't make sense to me. Like, you, I understand we need men to not rape, but that's not the current world that we live in. So I'm going to do what I can do to help women. And you do what you can do too. Like, let's, let's not be against each other. Let's all be for each other and find positive solutions. But I honestly didn't take it too personal. It was, an, it was more annoying than anything else to have people being so critical when, in my opinion, there was no need for it. Right. Well, you know, there, there's a certain element of the population that will always try and tear someone down and the further they go, the higher they get, the more that they'll want to tear them down because exactly. it exposes where they are hanging out in the trenches, slinging mud. Mm-hmm. We ain't got time for that. No, <laughs> no. Too much, too much good stuff to make happen to fall exactly to their words. Agreed. Now, today we've, we've already heard about a lot of really good things going on in your life. I'd mm-hmm. like for you to kind of flip it around for us now. Talk about something negative that's happened in your life and how you were able to lean on your martial arts to get past it. Oh, dear. Okay. Well, there's been things here and there, and I'm just going to go with the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, and I was in a really bad relationship where there was lots of infidelity and I was one of those girls that ended up staying with him and, you know, trying to figure out, make it work. And then towards the end, it started to get physical. And that was when I was like completely like peace out by, um, physically my martial arts helped me defend myself against a strong 
tall man. Um, and I think with like the discipline and everything, it finally kind of kicked in where I was like, you know what? No, I deserve better and I am valued and I have worth. And, and I knew that all along, my martial arts has taught me so much like self-worth and value, but I kind of lost that for a little bit. So I, even though I had lost it at a point, was able to lean back into the life skills and, and the self worth and self knowledge that I have learned through martial arts and um and even my martial art family. <laughs> Which, you know, there there are a lot of men at martial arts and I had the the guys being like, Who is this guy? I'll take care of him. And I was like, No, 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 we're good. Thank you. Never talking to him again. He's gone. But, you know, it's also I do appreciate the it's a very much a family feel that you have from martial arts. I know if there ever I did ever need any help in that way, I would have family there to support me as well, even though they're not my own physical family, but my Taekwondo martial art family. Mm. You know, that there's, there may be, I don't know if that was what you were expecting. No, no, it, it, it absolutely is. Um, You know, I, I think, I think when we talk about personal relationships, it's really easy to, to blame yourself, to speculate, Mm -hmm. you know, here, here's where I'm falling apart. Here's where I'm not good enough. Here's where, you know, whatever's happening to me is, is deserved. And, and this is a subject that we don't get into on the show very much. And, and full disclosure, it's because it's a subject I'm not always comfortable talking about because I've got some, mm-hmm. some stuff in my past that uh, right. I'm still working through. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it at yeah. that. But I appreciate your openness and, and just the, the realization that, it's it's all about moving forward. It's all about taking those steps. You know, as you were mm-hmm. talking about that, there there was I didn't catch a hint of woe is me, of of any kind of self deprecating vibe coming from you. Mm-hmm. It's it seemed very matter of fact. I, am I am I reading that right? Yeah, absolutely. And the thing that I I'm blessed to have an amazing mother and my mom has always taught me that every single thing you go through in life even if like some of it's self-inflicted in retrospect, looking back at it, you can learn life lessons and become better from that. So it's something that now I'm like, okay, obviously would have loved to not go through that, but I did. So I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to become a better person. I'm going to be able to help others before that. um, And I know we won't probably go too much into relationships, but before that, my, I had a friend that, stayed with a guy that had cheated on her and I did not understand. And I was like, she's such an idiot. Like, excuse my language, but I was like, what the heck? And then I went through it and now I have empathy for women that have experienced that. But I also was able to get out of that relationship and have that strength that it takes a lot of strength more than you would realize. So now I have empathy for that and I can help women. I work with women in women's shelters that, you know, are running from abusive, aggressive, unhealthy relationships. And I, I teach them self-defense and I teach their kids stranger danger. And I've now been there. And if I had never been there and had that life experience, I would not be able to relate um, and to empathize and to help these women on a different level that I know I'm able to. So, you know, it's all, it's all a life lesson. Everything that you go through is a life lesson, good or bad. And it's all how you relate to it. And if you relate to it in a healthy way, learning from it, then you can become a better person. So it becomes like a step up instead of a stumbling stone, if that makes sense. It does. Absolutely. And I think, I think that that ability to relate to people, to, to take something really so foul, it allows you to understand Uh someone else's pain, someone in the moment, because as you said, People that haven't had these experiences can often look at it pretty simplistically, you know, whether it's Mm -hmm. poor romantic relationships, whether it's addiction. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we can look at that when people don't have any context, it's really Mm -hmm. easy to be dismissive. But once we're able to embrace, we're able to have that empathy, we can truly be helpful. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Let's imagine that you're back 
2014, you're on the stage and, and rather than the question they asked you about rape on campus, they had asked you, what has been the most dynamic, exciting, or, or dramatic story from your martial arts career? And you had 30 seconds to tell it. What story would you have told the audience? <laughs> First of all, when you started that question, you, I had like the biggest smile on my face. And then I was like, oh, dang, we're going back to tragic <laughs> questions. Um, I love it. Okay, I honestly probably would have shared the story that I already shared with you about going from doing well at the regional level to competing at the, the international level and being like having this big head about me and ready to just kill it and then being completely humbled and not placing whatsoever and then coming back and winning. I feel like that was just, that was a huge life lesson for me and totally changed the game with just my perspective on success in general and not having a big head about yourself, even when you do so well at a certain level, because you just have to know, like there's always a level up and you can always become better and improve yourself. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that like stands out. I just, I have so many fun, great, martial art taekwondo memories but nothing like super super crazy dramatic that i can think of that's okay give us give us one of the smaller kind of anecdotal ones and then i'll I'll ask you something else okay hold on rephrase the question one more time i already kind of lost it (laughs) that's okay (laughs) tell tell us another fun you know exciting story if you know if if you were to sit down and write a book about Mm -hmm. you you know you're you're writing your autobiography and you're sprinkling in martial arts anecdotes from your time training or traveling or competing, you know, give, mm-hmm. us, give us another one of those. I actually, when I started training in jujitsu, I was training at an MMA gym in Washington state. So my Taekwondo instructor that I originally trained with in California ended up moving to Washington state and lived like 20 miles away from where my mom lived. My mom lives in Washington state. So when I would go up and visit my mom, I eventually moved up to live with my mom for a while. I went to train with him and he had this huge, massive, like six foot four, like MMA fighter, like super intense, scary guy. But I am so glad that I went and trained with him at that time because I started to learn jujitsu through that. And that was something that I think is so important because for a lot of martial arts that, I relate to like Taekwondo and karate and like this more stand up martial arts. I had never really learned groundwork. And so that was really fun. And it was fun. The context I learned in not just like at a normal jujitsu gym where it's like, all you're doing is jujitsu, but it was more MMA with a lot of jujitsu included. So that was, that was something really cool that was different than my original Taekwondo background. So I'm so thankful that I learned jujitsu and a little bit of MMA through that. And from like a really cool guy. I'm like, what the heck? This guy is massive. I've never seen someone so big in my life. <laughs> and, you know, but he's so quick and, and it was fun to like learn from someone so different than what I had ever experienced before. How did your Taekwondo help you as you learned more things there? And how did those things help your Taekwondo? Well, it's like, Dancing. I don't know why I'm relating it back to. Well, I'm relating it back to dancing because, you know, you your mind learns and picks up on moves and techniques and what is it? You know, like a, a whole dance faster the more you do it. It's kind of like a muscle memory. So the same thing really helped me from having done so many years of taekwondo to transition into jujitsu. Although the moves are completely different, you're on the ground, you're doing all these arm bars and choke holds and everything, but it. I already had kind of the muscle memory of being able to pick up and learn body movement and remember it so quickly. So the Taekwondo helped in that way. And then I think it just kind of helped in Taekwondo because I was more of a well-rounded martial artist. My mind started to think a little bit differently when I was doing jujitsu and MMA training than I had thought when I was in Taekwondo only. So it just helped me become more of a well-rounded martial artist. I was able to uh, respond to different situations when it was like, say, sparring or forms or even just training in class, I was able to be, I feel like, a little bit more dynamic because of training in multiple martial arts. Nice. And that's quite often the answer that people give, the idea that, you know, martial arts are pretty similar. They're more generally more similar than they are different. There's only so many ways you can move the body. and Right. You know, so. <laughs> now, you mentioned dance in there. Do you have a dance background, too? 
I danced a little bit in high school. I would not say I have a dance background. Um, I, if you ask my husband, I definitely don't have a dance background, <laughs> um, but I, I did love dance. I, but we had a cheer team and a dance team that essentially performed together on the football field. So I was on the dance team. And so I had a little bit, a teensy bit, and I loved it. And it was more jazz, ballet, hip hop kind of thing. But yeah, no, I'm not like a freestyler. I can do choreographed moves. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah. But it definitely helps with Taekwondo as well. Like they, I was so much more flexible. Like when I would do um, the dance class and the moves and everything, I was so much more flexible. So that because of Taekwondo, so that helped with dance. And then also I had like the strength in my legs that a lot of other dancers, especially as teens, didn't have. So Taekwondo helped that world for sure. Like they had me doing all the the bendy movie moves because I could do it and I had the strength for it because of Taekwondo. Now, if you look at your martial arts career, you know, from, mm-hmm. from age eight up until now, if you had to pick one person who has had the greatest influence on who you consider yourself to be as a martial artist, who would that person mm-hmm. be? Well, aside from my, can I say my instructor? Doesn't everybody say their instructor? They tend to. They tend to. Um, you haven't talked a lot about your instructor, so that so that's okay. Mm. If that's if that's where you want to go, tell us tell us a bit about who this person is and why they were so influential. Okay, so my instructor Eric Ray um, was absolutely amazing. He was. I I feel like I grew up in a little bit more of like an old school taekwondo, where if like the class got in trouble, we would go out into the parking lot and do knuckle push-ups on the cement or like do wall sits and he would like run across our legs. But I loved it. I don't know why, probably because like the military family that I come from. Um, So I definitely feel like I grew up in like a hardcore like Taekwondo class because I feel like nowadays we have to be so sensitive to every kid, which is important. But anywho, (laughs) I'm getting off track. Instructor was great. Um, I, I feel like I learned a lot of life skills from him and I looked at him as a business person. He was very organized and very professional business wise. So I would be at 16 years old running, helping run the studio because at that point I was a certified instructor and I had been around the studio so long that I was able to learn business from him as well as the life skills. It's like all these life skills that I learned and I attribute to Taekwondo came from my head instructor. So I feel like you have to kind of give credit where it's due. If it weren't for him, I may, I don't know, maybe someone would not have applied those life skills the way that he did that made me learn them so well. So definitely a lot that I learned was from my instructor. Nice. I feel like that was such a rambly answer. That was so like multifaceted. So sorry for that. But that's, that's how it tends to be. I mean, the best instructors are multi multifaceted and martial arts instructors, anyone that's ever owned a martial arts school knows how multifaceted the relationship with students can be. We're, we're teaching so many things. We're and we're learning so many things that become those life lessons that you have, have, held up with such high regard if it was a much simpler relationship i don't think it, martial arts would have the same impact i don't have too right. many people that i've ever heard say you know my elementary school soccer coach changed my life and right. not to say that it can't <laughs> exactly. happen and that it hasn't but that's a little bit more of a, a simple relationship not that it's not important not that soccer isn't great not that kids learning how to participate in team sports isn't wonderful but there's something special in the relationship between a martial arts instructor and a student yeah absolutely very much so all right now let's do the opposite of that question if there was someone that you could train with that you haven't anywhere in the world anywhere in time Uh who would that be well, funny enough that you ask, I hopefully will be training with the Gracies soon um, for, through jiu-jitsu, obviously, Gracie jiu-jitsu. I did not know that they had a school in Beverly Hills, but my dad has been a fan of the Gracies, especially the two brothers and the way that they teach for quite some time. 
And ever since he retired, he's been saying he's going to get an apartment up in Los Angeles and just train with them because he still loves martial arts. But I hope to be training with the Gracies very soon. Victoria Gracie, who is the wife of one of the Gracie brothers. I forget their names right now, but she teaches a women's jujitsu class in Beverly Hills. And I am so ready to get started. They're currently touring the world. They're going, they were in like North Korea and multiple places meeting up with their schools across the world. But once they get back, I hope to be able to start training with them. I think jujitsu is really important. Um, It's really important to know those type of escape techniques and those type of that type of ground work. And I teach women's martial, uh, women's self-defense. So it's easy for me all day long to teach stand-up techniques. And I also teach the ground techniques that I learned from my time doing jujitsu previously. But I think it will be such a tool for me to learn more from, especially the best of the best, like the Gracies are world renowned, um, and then be able to add that and just become more knowledgeable for the self-defense class that I already am teaching or classes that I'm already teaching. Nice. Tell us a little bit about those, that self-defense, those classes that you're, you're teaching. Is this something that you do in a specific location or you travel and do? So, right. It's more of a traveling, uh, it's a workshop, essentially, I guess I shouldn't say classes, more of a workshop. So I have been teaching women's self-defense for about five years now from all the techniques that I've learned through multiple martial art trainings. And I absolutely love it. I started off teaching in women's shelters, um, stranger danger to kids, and then self-defense to the women. Obviously, as I mentioned, it became part of my platform as Miss USA. And more recently, I have decided to do it on my own. So until actually about a month ago, I would companies would fly me out. I would teach self-defense to their women or different organizations. So I taught self-defense regularly, but I never did my own class or my own workshop. So now a few times a year, I plan on hosting women's self-defense classes in different places across the country. I did two weekends in Los Angeles and it was absolutely amazing. I had more than 60 women attend and it was just, it was, I felt like it was very life-changing. The women learned so much and I had the best response. I'm planning on teaching in New York and Miami in the late summer, early fall, and then possibly Chicago after that. So I I have a few that I'm planning across the country, no set dates at the moment, trying to lock down venues first, but it's just, I think every woman should at least know some techniques and should feel empowered to be able to defend themselves. I've had so many women that have said, I didn't even think about half of the scenarios that you mentioned during your class. And honestly, if someone came up to me, I would have no idea what to do. I'm so glad that I now have, I I describe it as tools in the tool belt. You know, they say, I have some tools in my tool belt and I want to learn more. So for me, it's more to kind of get women started with learning self-defense. And then if they want to continue training somewhere else, that's great. Or if they want to come back to another workshop that I do, they'll continue to learn more and perfect their techniques. But I love teaching women self-defense. I feel like that's kind of where my martial arts journey has taken me. And I'll continue to train in martial arts here and there because I love it. But self-defense is like my main focus right now for women. Nice. I've had the opportunity to speak with a a number of people who teach women self-defense. And among the Mm -hmm. women that teach women self-defense, they've often recounted, sometimes on the show, sometimes honestly more so privately to me, after or Mm -hmm. other times, some of the stories, the powerful stories that they hear Mm. from the people that they're teaching. And I'm going, Mm -hmm. I'm guessing, you know, just in in the way you went, "Mm," that you've had some folks tell you some of that stuff. Some of the, the, these, sometimes it's horrible. Sometimes it, you know, has a a happy ending, you know, at the last second or, or whatever. How do you handle that? Because I would imagine, and, and this is this is this is me, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth or anybody that might be listening. Mm-hmm. If I step up in front of a group and I'm teaching self-defense, and mm-hmm. you know, the last three times I've taught it, I've had people come up to me and tell me about these rough things going on that led mm-hmm. them to come. I might be putting a little bit too much weight on my shoulders mm-hmm. in teaching and in, in in you know, trying to personally take on the 
well-being of everyone in front of me or or maybe maybe you do that and and that's the way through i i don't know i'm obviously i'm not a woman and i don't teach women self-defense Hmm. yeah it's uh it's definitely heavy when you hear those stories there's stories that have made me want to cry i've, I've sat and i've cried with women um i think empathy is number one most important and then when I talk to women, one of the main things I always share with them, whether it's talking in person or speaking in front of the large group is, first of all, it's never your fault. You never, you know, didn't do enough. It's, that's never the situation. You always, a woman will always do everything she can to get away, get out of the situation, whatever it is. You and what I the way I describe it is you do everything you can with the tools that you have, and you know it's it, the main thing is it's never your fault. So when I teach, I say you know you did everything you possibly could. Period. Or if you ever, God forbid, are in a bad situation where something is happening, you will do everything you can with every tool that you have. What I'm here to do is I'm here to give you more tools. So. If, God forbid, something happens, you have more tools and more resources in your brain and your mind to be able to help get out of that situation. Um, but it, it's, it is hard. But the thing is, it's never like the woman, the man should have not attacked in the first place. And you do everything you can with what you have. So it's, it's definitely hard. It's heavy. I've heard, like you mentioned, I've heard so many stories, but I just do my part to try to be able to help as, as much as I can. And that's really all we can do, right? You, you do what you can mm-hmm. and where you are with what you have. Exactly. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Um, yes. Have you seen <laughs> It Man? Of course. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I, I mean, I feel like it's such a classic and I ended up watching It Man when I lived in Hong Kong in Cantonese with English subtitles. So I feel like I got a really authentic experience watching it like in, in Asia. Uh, but that I had never really watched martial art movies until that movie. And that was kind of my first when I lived in Hong Kong. So I feel like sometimes the first martial art movie is like, if you, if you get a good one, it's, it's a good classic and it's your favorite. So that's definitely yeah. the case for me. Yeah. Actually, I have a theory that, the first martial arts movie people watch, assuming it's not completely horrid, is the one that mm-hmm. sticks with them the most. For so many people, it was it's Billy Jack or it's Enter the Dragon or it's the Karate Kid or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's oh, that first. Oh my gosh, Billy Jack! I can't believe you just said that. That's crazy. Why? I watched it when I was a kid. My dad had me watch that when I was like six years old, and he was like. Well, maybe it wasn't closer to when I was starting Taekwondo, maybe eight years old. And he would always, he loved the scene where, if I'm thinking of the right movie, where he was like, this foot's going to hit you on that side of the yeah. face. Is that the same movie? Yeah, that is, yes. that oh is the movie. That is the movie. That's my dad's favorite movie. Oh my gosh. Favorite martial art movie, at least. Yeah. Uh, I love it. I, I totally forgot about that movie. We did a whole profile on that, you know, dug in a lot of behind the scenes stuff with, of course, a video clip embedded in there of, of mm-hmm. that, that famous seat. I'm going to take this foot and put it on that side of your face and there's nothing that you can do about it. And of course, yes. for anyone that might be new to the show, we'll drop links to everything we're talking about today, photos and, and the whole shebang, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. What a lot of people don't realize is that Billy Jack was earlier than Enter the Dragon, earlier than a lot of the movies that you know we think of from that era. Mm-hmm. And there's just, there's it something. Was an OG. Oh, totally. Totally. And it, it got into, yeah. you know, got into issues of, of uh, you know, racism and just, there's just so much mm-hmm. stuff going on there that a lot of martial arts films weren't willing to touch it. It kind of checks a lot of boxes. It does. Now I'm going to have to watch that. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. I haven't seen it in so long. There's That's actually be happening tonight. three, I want to say there are three of them. And then okay. there was a yeah, fourth that got a script that didn't actually come out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's some, hmm. some interesting stuff in there and, and um, 
No, I don't. I don't want to ruin it in case in case anybody wants to hasn't watched it or or wants to go listen to that episode. How about? Oh yeah. Been, how about martial arts actors? You know, is is it? Are you going to pull from it, man, and say Donnie Yen, or maybe we've got somebody else on the list? Um, I feel like Bruce Lee is such a such a classic. I feel like he, he, I almost have to say him. Um, and I honestly haven't even watched that many of his movies, but it kind of relates back to Hong Kong. When I lived in Hong Kong, they had this huge. First of all, he's just an amazing martial artist, but. In Hong Kong, they have this statue of him on their little Hollywood Walk of Fame. And I kind of started my fascination with Bruce Lee around that time. So that is also just a favorite martial artist when it comes to, like, like you said, like, you know, the famous martial artists that are in movies and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, for that aspect, Bruce Lee, for sure. Nice. And listeners, I... I was unaware of this statue and actually just pulled it up as Master Sanchez was talking about it. And I'll I'll drop a photo in because this is this is super cool. That's such a sick statue. I'm like, oh my gosh! I, you, yeah. everyone, if you're in Hong Kong, you need to go there and take a picture in the same pose as him. I feel like you have. It's like oh, a must do right. if you go to Hong Kong. Oh, I should go to Hong yeah. Kong just for that. Now, wh- why were you in Hong Kong? Was this? You said uh, you were military. Kid, right? Uh, yeah, I do come from a military family. My dad was out of the military by the time I was born. Uh, but I, after high school, I traveled a lot. So I lived in Germany. I actually trained a little bit in Taekwondo in Germany. I've lived and spent, uh, lived, spent a significant amount of time in the Middle East, in the United Arab Emirates, in Abu Dhabi. And then I lived in Hong Kong and I worked in Hong Kong on a Disney contract. But that's where I actually took Muay Thai because I was like dying to be away from my martial art training. So I signed up for a Muay Thai class and I took Muay Thai when I lived in Hong Kong. Cool. Yeah. Would you go back? Oh my gosh. Hong Kong is one of my most favorite cities in the entire world. Okay. I've been to New York. I lived in New York a little bit and I've been back to New York a few times and New York is kind of creeping up to match Hong Kong. But for a while, Hong Kong has been my number one. Uh, I love the history. I love that it's a very, you know, new city, but then there's so much history at the same time. You could be seeing a brand new skyscraper right next to an old temple that they've preserved that's been around for hundreds of years. So I love Hong Kong and I love the diversity of it. It's it's a really cool city. I think you've never been and you're looking for a cool city to travel to. Hong Kong's a cool place to visit. Right on. Now how about books? Or shorts books or mm. Can, can be a little polarizing. People tend to either love them and have a huge collection or... or no. Right. Where do you fall? I am a huge reader, but I have... I'm, I don't think I've ever read a martial art book besides, like, the student manual <laughs> from <laughs> my Taekwondo experience growing up. And I remember we had to memorize what um, the meaning was behind our the name of our forms, like Chunji, Dongun, Dosan, Wanyu, those I went, I trained in ITA Taekwondo, I believe it's the type of Taekwondo that I trained in, so not World Taekwondo Federation, which now I work with them and love them, but yeah, the only type of Taekwondo reading I've ever done, or martial art reading in general, as far as I can remember, is just learning more about Korean Taekwondo history. Now, I'll put versus, you on this. Versus, like, reading a book. I'm going to put you on the spot because you're used to it. I Uh-oh. wouldn't do this to very many other people. Ah. So the, most of the listeners know that, that I've practiced a number of different martial arts and that I currently train in ITF Taekwondo as, as one of the styles. Do you remember the oh, definition of Chung Ji? No. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I don't. Do you? I remember the, the part of it. Heaven and Earth. Tell me. Tell me, I'm fascinated right now. Oh, I would, I would have to look it up, and hopefully my instructor. Oh, I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. Working. See, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. Turnabout is fair, though. I should have known. No, um, oh, thank no. I used to have like Wanya or Wan, some one of the like. No, you, you had it. That's, that's why I asked because it sounded like you could have kept going up. All right, I, I did for a while. Um, I had it all memorized years after I didn't even have those current belts. 
Um, you know, say when I was a black belt, I still had the purple belt memorized with the blue belt, but it's gone. Can't can't bring it back right now. It's okay. It's all right. But that's I, cool. Okay, so I, I tend to cram taekwondo. for my time. Most for people my don't train in that um that taekwondo. So that's cool that we have that in common. Yeah. I really don't know a lot of people that have trained in that type of taekwondo. Well, if you pick if you're if you're still passionate about taekwondo and this is for for you and all the listeners we we went through a phase where it seemed like it popped up in every episode whether it was a taekwondo practitioner we were talking to or not but Alex Gillis's book A Killing Art which is an amazing okay. really journalistic exploration of the founding of taekwondo and how ITF and WTF happened and and just all the all the stuff it, it's something that I don't read a lot. My brain mm-hmm. wanders, but I had no problem staying engaged with this book. It's an incredible book. Well, I'm going to write that down and I'm going to make that happen because I do read a lot and I would totally be fascinated. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. If people are listening, if they want to get a hold of you or find you online, social media, websites, you know, any of that, how would they do so? Pretty simple across the board, Real Nia Sanchez for just about all of my social media. Um, and then my website should be up in a few weeks, and that's going to be niasanchez.com. That is a place where you can definitely find out about events that I'm hosting. I do women's networking events as well as women's self-defense classes. And I'm always doing them in different places across the country. So who knows? I could be coming to you know, be near someone soon that's listening. So niasanchez.com hopefully will be up soon. And if not, just real Nia Sanchez, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of the above. Great. And there'll be a couple weeks in between our recording today and when this airs. So hopefully, hopefully it'll be up. And of course, hopefully. folks, yeah. we'll, we'll drop links over at the show notes. And if the Thank link is you. there, you know, it, it'll be good. And of course, you know, Anything else that you start doing in the future, we'll update those show notes if you send it over to us because this is you. This is a this is this is a capture of your martial arts story. Yes. Well, I have really enjoyed talking to you and I definitely I have to get that book name for me one more time because I'm gonna read that book very sure. soon. A Killing Art by Alex Gillis. A killing art is the name of that book. Got it. And I appreciate you coming on today. This has been a lot of fun. Glad that we finally got to make this happen. And listeners, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'd like to ask you one more favor, if you would, to send us out with some parting words for everyone listening. Oh, that's a good one. Um, To everyone listening, never give up on your dreams. You can absolutely make them happen if you just keep moving forward one step at a time. When I look on this episode, the thing I'm most struck by is Master Sanchez's positive attitude, just her willingness to accept where she is, to learn from her circumstances, to move on. Those of you listening might think, well, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is part of an act, but this is part of her pageant persona. Well, I can tell you from the numerous emails and the time we spent before and after talking about martial arts, and a number of other things. It doesn't seem like a persona. This is who she is. She's the real deal. It's clear that she's passionate not only about martial arts, but about working with people in whatever that context is. And I can't think of a better person to do that. Thank you, Master Sanchez, for coming on the show today. Remember, you can find the show notes with links to everything we talked about today, a number of photos, a bunch of other stuff, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you want to find us or Master Sanchez on social media, you can find those links over there as well. If you want to check out the products that we've got going on, whistlekick.com or on Amazon. And as always, you can email me directly. I'm still able to keep up with the email. It's getting harder. But that's because you guys are sending such great feedback, such wonderful questions. Jeremy at whistlekick.com is the best way to get me. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.